So very good evening from Auto TV and Assam India. We are live now. Sir, we please start. Um, good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Ruta Kulkarni, President Assam India. I welcome you all for this third grand round. And this grand round is organized by Maharashtra State Chapter. And the state representatives are Dr. Mandar Acharya and Dr. Ashish Ranade. The topic of today's grand round is congenital pseudoarthrosis of tibia. And we are really fortunate to have Dr. James Fernandez from Sheffield, UK as the chief faculty for today's webinar. I heartily welcome you, sir. We are really honored to have you. And I'm sure you will enlighten all of us about this complicated and controversial topic in pediatric orthopedics. So thanks again and welcome. I welcome uh, all other uh, faculty members, Dr. Satish Nesri and uh, uh, Dr. Vache, welcome. I also welcome the members on the panel and all the viewers who have logged in, who are watching. So uh, let's go for this academic feast. I hand over this meeting to Dr. Ravi. Over Thank to you, you Ravi. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Well, congenital pseudoarthrosis of tibia, as ma'am already told that it's full of complications and full of controversies. It has always been a debatable issue, ranging from its uh, surgical techniques to the incidence of refractures. But uh, irrespective of these controversies and debates, pathology needs to be tackled in the best possible way. And to resolve such issues, we have with us today our keynote speaker, Dr. James Fernandez, whose work in pediatric limb reconstruction is unparalleled. So I welcome, sir, and I'm really thankful for him to spare such a valuable time. And uh, I'm also really thankful for other faculty members who have spared their valuable time for today's meeting. So our meeting will be first uh, Dr. James Fernandez lecture and followed by the case presentations by other faculty members. And uh, I'm also thankful for Dr. Samshul, who is our joint secretary, Dr. Ashok Shyam, who is the editor in chief of Ortho TV, Dr. Manish Prasad, who is our head of IT, and uh, Dr. Neeraj Bijlani, who is the co-editor of Ortho TV, for providing such a valuable technical support. And I'm also thankful for all the Asami members, our executive members, and working committee members who are with us for today's evening. Thank you. So without wasting time, I'm handing over to Dr. Mandar Acharya just to initiate the proceedings and for the faculty introduction. Dr. Mandar, hand over to you, please. I'm sharing the screen now. So good evening, everyone. So today's topic of Assam India's grand round is, as you all know, congenital pseudoarthritis of tibia. And it's an honor to introduce Dr. James Fernandez, who is a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon, limb reconstruction at Sheffield Children Hospital. He initially was trained in India, then at Liverpool and Sheffield Children's Hospital center of excellence, as well as he visits to many prestigious institutions abroad. His special interests are limb reconstruction, skeletal dysplasias, uh, developmental dysplasia of hip, and general orthopedics. He frequently lectures at national and international meetings. His involvement in the research has led to extensive publications. He has held various important roles in education and training programs. <clears throat> He has held quite a few notable positions in national societies, including past president of BLRS, Society of BSCOS, and chairman of World Assembly Branch. I also welcome uh, Dr. Ruta Kulkarni, president of Assam India. She is professor of orthopedics at Postgraduate Institute of Swasti of Pratishtan. She has many publications in national and international journals, has been teaching Ilizaro as a faculty since last 20 years in many conferences and the main topics of her interest are 
correction, deformity correction and limb lengthening. I welcome Dr. Satish Nesri, sir, who is Assistant Professor in Department of Orthopedics at BIMS Bega. He is a faculty of Assami India. He is honorary consultant at Weizgang uh, University in China. He is a reviewer of International uh, Journal of Limb Lengthening and has got publications in national and international journals. My colleague, Dr. Gurunath Vachche, he is associate professor at VM Medical College, Solapur. He has undergone fellowships in Singapore and USA. He is an AO faculty. He is executive member of uh, Indian Foot and Ankle Society and has got national and international presentations. Last, it's a pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Ashish Ranade, who initially uh, was trained in India in Pune itself and then went to UK and US. <clears throat> he has done fellowship training in limb lengthening and deformity correction at Baltimore, Shriners and St. Christopher Hospital in, and also in pediatric spine. He has co-authored four book chapters and many publications. Currently, he is attached to Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital, Pune. So I will stop sharing the screen now as we have done introduction of all the people and I request James sir to proceed with his lecture. So thank you all, especially to Mandar and uh, Ashish uh, for organizing this and to Dr. Kulkarni as the president to, to welcome us, me as well and uh, Dr. Ravi Chauhan. And it's always a pleasure to be uh, back on, um, you know, we can't see each other in person, but at least uh, on Zoom, which probably we're all also getting a bit fatigued since the last year as well. Anyway, so I'll just, the remit of my talk is sort of, I'll give a little background of the condition, uh, what we are doing currently in Sheffield and we have done some review of our cases in the past, and we have recently reviewed our own uh, type four Crawford cases and some case examples. Uh, I'm not gonna give you extensive review or literature, but I'll mention a few things as we go. So though commonly we call it congenital pseudarthrosis of tibia, but it's a spectrum of disorder, as you know, anterolateral bowing of tibia comes under the same spectrum. So it could be mild, and then as it goes further, it goes to pseudarthrosis. Uh, when it's true, truly, you've got a, a absolute uh, uh, discontinuity between the tibia or sometimes between the tibia and the fibula. Uh, by being bilateral, it's extremely rare, and association with neurofibromatosis possibly is uh, in literature somewhere between 50 to 90%. And our own series is somewhere between 60 to 65 percent. 15 percent of these uh, are associated with fibrous dysplasia and also the odd uh, amniotic band syndrome. Now, you have to know a bit of neurofibromatosis because I think the group of patients who have NF probably are more resistant to treatment rather than the classic one, which is not associated with any of the background syndromic condition. And NF, as you know, is uh, hereditary, autosomal dominant. Again, it's a hematomatous disorder of the central nervous system, peripheral, as well as skin and skeleton. Uh, also, we, we think that uh, uh, it may be rare, but actually it's the most commonest genetic disorder. And as I've been told by my geneticist that about one in 3000 people actually carry this gene and 50% of these are all spontaneous uh, mutations. Of course, uh, this is for younger trainees. So if they are on the web, uh, as you know, NF is classified to type one and type two. And we normally see the type one associated with pseudarthrosis of tibia, otherwise called von Reckling Orson's disease. Uh, it's the defect is on chromosome 17. They have actually encoded the gene to the neurofibromin protein, which is a tumor suppressor gene, a key protein in cell growth and differentiation, also called as peripheral NF otherwise. But as NF2 is associated with bilateral acoustic neurofibromas and brain tumors, 
but the defect is on chromosome 22 and also called as central NF. They do not have much association with orthopedic manifestations. They're quite rare. This is a nice way for anyone to remember how to uh, use the criteria. Uh, uh, KF spot or CAFE, SPOT, I'm not going to uh, go through each one. Uh, if you have two or more, then the probability of having NF is high. One should also remember some of these signs may not be seen until the age of five. And uh, when you send them to the geneticist, occasionally, initially, you may not get the diagnosis. You may get it later on. So Caffele spots, uh, the classic Caffele of uh, what we call the coast of California, because they are smooth, unlike the McEwen Albright ones, which is called the coast of Maine. They get freckling of the axillary and inguinal region, fibromas. And if you have one single plexiform type, it's quite a strong suggestion association with the NF. Uh, leash nodules in the eye are called pathognomonic. We always think as orthopedic surgeon that congenital pseudosis of tibia is more common, but actually scoliosis is probably more common. And the classic uh, uh, curve is a short angular, or sometimes you get the long, long C dysplastic. Hemihypertrophy is uh, the least common association, and uh, we have a few examples in our database as well. O stands for optic and optic glioma of our series of almost, I think, uh, 80 or 90 kids. At least uh, two went on to develop optic gliomas. So what's the pathology? If NF is hematomatous, this one also probably is the same. It's a segmental dysplasia of the tibia and fibula causing uh, the bowing and eventual fracture. Uh, this can be diagnosed antenatally or presence in first year of life with an obvious angular deformity. Only re more recently, uh, we have, uh, in the last few years, we have understood it better, and we now know that the periosteum is at fault, that it is replaced by thickened invasive hematomatous tissue, which exhibits uh, one biological effects through increased osteoclastic activity, or mechanical effect constricts periosteal vasculature, and fibroblasts formed instead of Schwann cells or perineural cells. So for many years uh, of our older literature, we were concentrating more on the bone and actually the bone was not at fault. So what about the natural history is unfavorable generally. Earlier the fracture leads on to more severe type of dysplasia and more refractory to treatment. Having recurrent fractures can have growth arrest and persistent deformity limb short shortening. And one of the problems, they also get valgus ankles, especially if the fibula also has a pseudarthrosis. So there are many classifications, uh, the older ones and there are newer ones. And I suppose uh, this is something not necessarily important for an exam, but probably uh, most of in recent literature, we are using uh, Crawford to some extent. And Crawford 4 is probably the worst one. And I think the four, Crawford 4 probably should be uh, separated out from the others because I think uh, that group is the most difficult to treat. Boyd is almost similar, but uh, it's six types. And we have got newer classifications of Paley's, basically uh, talking about whether it's atrophic in nature or hypertrophic, and if one has had previous surgery and how stiff the pseudoarthrosis is. So in some ways, it helps you in the understanding of uh, what technique to apply accordingly. Clinical features, if you see some a child referred to you in clinic, you're going to look at the leg, of course, but and if it's fractured, you'll see uh, usually painless mobility. You may notice deformity and shortening. We went through all the clinical signs. Uh, family history of NF is the most important thing you can find out. And sometimes they come as late presentations because the, it would not, would not have been noticed in the initial years. That's a back to show you some cafe au lait spots. So what are the problems for us? A non-union or a deformity and leg length discrepancy. And for us, the goals of treatment is to obtain union or straighten the bone, prevent refracture throughout growth, correct the limb alignment and length at maturity. And since many of these neurofibromatosis children uh, have other problems, 
you need to make sure they are seen by other uh, disciplines. Uh, in the United Kingdom, we have special NF clinics run by endocrinologists or pediatrician, and they check them on a yearly basis. Uh, ophthalmologists as well as they check their blood pressures. Uh, they do the, uh, in the adults, they do the VMA, vanilla, vanilla mandelic acid to make sure they don't miss any tumors. I had a young child whom we picked up uh, hypertension turned out to have renal artery stenosis. So I think uh, being pediatric orthopedic surgeons, I think it's our duty to make sure they are also managed uh, for the other uh, uh, unfortunate uh, complications of NF. Yes, prophylactic bracing uh, can be done. We do clamshell orthosis in the younger child. Uh, it may protect until fracture occurs. It's very rare that we brace most of them to skeletal maturity. The only ones I may brace is where there's a very mild bow and the canal is absolutely intact. So that means there's an intramedullary canal and it's least likely to break. As they get older, you can free up the ankle joint. But one should remember, you can't cure the background pathology. So what surgical options do we have? I suppose if you go from history and actually if you go back to Benjamin Joseph's uh, original uh, paper and uh, even when he goes and gives his talk on this, he will talk about how oh, the old, each of those techniques had some basis. And actually only when you combine these techniques, do you tend to get the best results. So I've just put them in a, a surgical option is as to stabilize or to realign. So you will use a method, uh, intermedullary fixation, either with stationary or growing rods. In recent times, we're using minimally invasive plates uh, made by Smith & Nephew, we call them EWOS, or external fixators, hybrid. I've intentionally kept vascular fibula graft aside on this. And to get it to heal, you want some bone from elsewhere. So bone graft from the tibia or from the pelvis. Vascularized free blood graft when you have a bigger gap, which nowadays, since I don't remove the bone so much, I don't need to need fibula grafts anymore. So we have stopped doing vascular free blood graft. Periosteal wrap, I do use them. I'm not too sure to great extent, but when I use them at the back, where after the reconstruction, we do see extensive bone formation at the back as well. We use BMP because uh, it does promote a lot of bone formation at the site. Originally, there was some problems for us uh, as we are not licensed to use in children. But recently, after discussion with the management of the hospital and pharmacy, they have agreed for me to use on a special consent basis. There is anecdotal evidence that BMP can uh, sort of produce tumors in the future, especially could be in NF. So we are not too sure about that. So I do inform my patients accordingly. There is quite a bit of talk about bisphosphonates, which probably uh, started with David Little from Australia and then Draw Paley has used it in his Paley X Union. Uh, our metabolic uh, physicians sort of are not very keen, so we are not actually using bisphosphonates. Uh, stem cells, I think uh, Brisha Madhuri from Velo published a paper on it, uh, though she said you might need more adjuncts along with that. Amputation is one of the options, but it's only reserved, I would say, for failed cases. Though we have had patients who have been offered this on the continent as a primary option. What about success? If you look at literature, bone union uh, is almost anywhere between 31 to 100 percent. But I suppose if you look at the older series, the most important thing of resecting the hamartomatous tissue was not being done. And probably that might be one of the reasons why the success rate was not, uh, why the success rate was that low. But the refracture risk is still high. And most of the series is anywhere between 14 to 60 percent and uh, even the series of Paley's published by Tabet at almost 40% fracture rate. And also because different surgeons use different techniques, it's a little difficult uh, to sort of look at results in a very, very uh, properly manner uh, or to use meta-analysis because many other adjuncts and, uh, are used in the treatment uh, more and more so in recent times. So vascular fibula graft has also has had good results. If you see in literature, 
usually also stabilized with rod or internal fixation with good rates of primary or secondary union. But again, there's high refracture risk, uh, non-union at the distal grafting site, uh, valgus ankle, and also residual limb length discrepancy. This is one of our uh, children who had a, a, a vascularized fibula graft, which had a good result. And finally, when she was an adult, uh, she was discharged, though she did fracture the contralateral tibia, which I had to treat. Circular frames, the beauty of them, as we all know, being limb reconsurgence, allows correction of length and angulation and using a separate proximal osteotomy site to gain length. We felt that it was, at that time, should be combined with intermedullary rod to prevent refracture following removal of fixator. And it's also useful in the older children where rod alone has insufficient mechanical properties. But of course, one should remember, if you have a fixator and a rod, the chance of infection of the whole diaphysis is high. And we have had two such instances in my 24 years at Sheffield. Intermediate rod is, is basically something to splint it internally and provide sustained stability. You may have to exchange it as the child grows. Of course, if you can't have telescopic rods, you can use uh, rush nails or wires, and even for the fibula to aid stability. I am more and more now uh, trying to osteosynthesize the fibula because uh, their ankle scores are quite poor because of valgus ankles. And there's a good paper, of course, which came out from Korea. The main issue, again, is stability of the distal segment. And therefore, you need, if you're avoiding a frame, it you may be important that you have to put a rod through the calcaneum uh, right across the ankle and subtalar joints, as first described again by Benjamin Joseph. Uh, again, this is better in younger children, if not supplemented with external fixator. To promote healing, Periosteal wrap, which I mentioned earlier, I usually use a skin measure to, to make it even bigger. Uh, we now encourage tibia fibular synostosis. I do it in two rounds purely because uh, our anesthetists won't allow us to harvest graft from both sides of the pelvis. They do have a lot of blood loss and uh, many of them are very small built. As you know, they are also uh, finally have short stature as well, in, especially in NF. Uh, we do take uh, quite a bit of corticocancerous grass from the iliac crest. And I mentioned about BNP and bisphosphonates. There were in the past where we have used ultrasound and electrical stimulation. I suppose we are not too sure how good they are in the, in, 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 as adjuncts. Timing of surgery has been looked at. Uh, EPOS did a multicentric study. Unfortunately, it was uh, different centers using different techniques. But they felt that surgery in the older child had better outcomes. Uh, and general aim for age, uh, possibly a four to five, but best not to do below age three. Occasionally I've done uh, above the age of two, but not definitely not below the age of two, uh, depending on the type of treatment uh, as per Joseph, uh, Benjamin's paper as well. And of course, I still treat them in brace until then. Amputation, I would think if you have given three or more good attempts, uh, thrown in the kitchen sink and you have still failed, probably amputation is the reasonable uh, uh, answer. We have had two, uh, one who was treated multiply elsewhere and one of mine who developed a tumor of the brain. And they are the two whom we had to amputate and they, they, they felt really good after the amputation purely because their life, uh, you remove them of their misery of uh, having a kind of flail deformed leg. Just a few examples to show you uh, to start with. Uh, this is 8.3 in 2013, where we have used excision periosteal wrap bone graft FT rod, and then again revision rod in 2016. So of course, this is an antilateral bow of tibia, which we had watched, grafted FT rod, went on to heal. And this is another one at 8.3, same kind of concept, but uh, see what at 8.3, 5 and 9, so this is a true pseudarthrosis and everything was looking good, healing, but as time went by, migrated, uh, developed a fracture through that site, used a uh, stacked uh, Elizarov to correct it. Though we got, uh, got it to heal, of course, the fibula is still uh, not, un uh, sort of, uh, not united, the ankle is in valgus. Uh, and then that was uh, at age seven. 
And at age nine, we went on to do the same for the fibula. Did corrective osteotomy, stabilized again with the intermediary uh, nail, periosteal wrap. And that's the end result with nice, uh, reasonably straight, as well as the fibula uh, osteosynthesized. Interestingly, once you osteosynthesize the fibula, I've noticed that the fibula starts to grow and tries to get the ankle mechanics quite normal. So it's very interesting how nature or Wolf's phenomenon and other laws of nature are working uh, while you want to recreate anatomy. So we did an audit of our first uh, series in 2014, and we tried to look up for, at our internally fixed and externally fixed uh, cases. And we tried to compare results before 99, and I became a locum consultant in 99, and then a permanent in 2000. So we wanted to see what how our results were. Though it was retrospective, uh, we looked predominantly at the case notes, radiographs, uh, and question is as well. Unfortunately, our returns for ASCO and uh, SF36 were very poor. And we also looked at all this number of revision procedures, weight bearing union and complications. So we had 51 cases uh, until 2014, which 10 were being treated at that time. Five were unobtainable case notes and seven, we didn't have a complete set of radiographs. You can see the age distribution, uh, both for internal fixation, we're all uh, in the younger age group and circular fixators later age groups. Now remember, some of them will be tertiary referrals who have been treated maybe before. And if you see uh, stabilization 50% with intermediary uh, rods and external fixation with 50%. And of the external fixators where we use, some had uh, uh, with the rod internal in addition, and we had a free fibular graft in 17% of them. A combination of angular correction and lengthening, as you can see with when we use the frame, so which is the benefit of the frame. And in, in terms of results, uh, though you may not be able to see each of those uh, pre-1999, it, it took us more number of revisions and these revisions reduced after 1999. Maybe we started to do things a little bit differently. And the good thing about weight bearing, of course, if you use a circular fixator, we make them weight bear uh, soon after, maybe two or three days after that. Whereas if you're using internal fixation, we will be putting them in casts and it could be anywhere between 12 weeks to 16 weeks before they actually bear weight. You can see the union of the pseudarthrosis only. This is, is a bit earlier than internal fixation. And similarly, when excluding calotesis, the same kind of results. And we looked at and compared this pre-99 and post-99, and there was definitely, definitely some improvement in both these uh, findings. We looked at also valgus ankles. As you can see, quite a few, 16% had valgus ankles with internal fixation, of course, less with external fixation, but of course, we couldn't analyze the reason, uh, probably we kept the alignment much more straight. Uh, one more thing, when we use intermediate rods, I'm seeing more and more uh, valgus deformity developing at the proximal tibia. And very recently we've been adding guided growth at the top to realign them. So if you look at refractures also, uh, both have had refractures, internal and external, uh, as you can see. And Pre-1999 and post-1999, also similarly around, possibly less after post-1999. But you look at infections, we have had our fair share. And I think, as you know, of course, it will be external fixators who probably will have a higher chance, and especially when we have a, a rod inside. And then we had to go and do rescue surgery for these uh, when they get infected. Uh, and uh, it is quite more difficult. And one of them had to rescue by doing a, a masculine type of technique through the introscious membrane and getting them to unite uh, cross union between the fibula to the tibia. And I've got uh, another one, which I'll show you an example later on, which is just coming down the corner. So we had uh, amputations before 1999 and we didn't have uh, till about 2018. And I, like I said, I've done two, one from elsewhere who had multiple operations and one of mine who had a tumor who finally decided to have uh, the leg removed. 
So from this uh, uh, little audit which we did, uh, overall our rates of union reoperation and amputation were similar to other studies, and there was significant benefits of frame uh, use regarding number of operations, rate of weight bearing, and union and amputation. So there was some distinct improvement in our outcomes from 99 onwards. Of course, the study was retrospective, unequal comparison between the two groups and poor response to functional questionnaires. I think that's most important. We looked at our, uh, our further series in 2018 and we thought we'll look only at Crawford type four this time. And we excluded all the others and we looked at union rate, time to union, residual deformities and refracture. And we had totally 23 who reached skeletally mature patients out of which 60% had NF, three had vascular fibula graft, seven X fixes, and more number with rotting. Of course, with the combination of excision of hamartoma and all the other adjunctive stuff. So overall union rate again is 70%, time to union around seven to eight months, refracture rate 30%, as you can see. But as with the vascular fibula graft, uh, a, three of them, uh, rough age was six years, time to union seven, source of fibula two was contralateral, one was ipsilateral, and the union rate only two out of three, and residual malalignment in two, which needed further correction. This is just one of the examples uh, for the vascular fibula graft. Of the seven external fixation, again, they were uh, average age was 6.1, union rate six out of seven, which was 85%, and time to union eight months. And you should see still, you may have to bone graft further. So average number of surgeries were still three overall for this whole Crawford type four, but they didn't have any malalignment at skeletal maturity. If you look at the rotting group, only 61% non-union and time to union was eight months. And two, those days uh, we never used to go to the ankle. Uh, so two out of 13. Uh, residual malalignment was 53% and refracture rate of 53%. Another example, this is the old Sheffield rod, which we don't use in the tibia anymore. And it was further revised uh, later on. But of course, this one is an example, example which went on to heal. So if you look at the groups and uh, we compared our series to the series from Manipal, uh, from by Hitesha and Benjamin Joseph. And more recently, they published the big multicentric uh, a study where uh, they had uh, 119 patients. Of course, if you look at the refracture rate, 42% in that multi-centered group, we have about 30% here, as you can see. And these are all only Crawford type fours, as you can see. Now we do have a lesser union rate, but we certain things which we are not using are also other adjuncts uh, are not included. Very interestingly, in this paper of 2018, they felt that the BMP did not make much of a difference, which possibly we don't feel it. We, we think BMP has made a big difference in a healing of our uh, uh, pseudarthrosis. So the present patients whom I'm treating with Crawford type four, average age, as you can see, 3.8 years, union rate is 80%, so we are creeping up. They're not skeletally mature and no residual deformities as such, apart from valgus, which we are treating with guided growth at the top end. So we compared this series as well, uh, uh, and that 2008 by Tabet is the paper from uh, Drop Paley's unit. They had a refracture of 50% at that time. So subsequently, Paley has published uh, about his Paley X unit saying he's got no refractures, but of course uh, they are still young and they have not reached skeletal maturity. So our current treatment is primarily the hamartoma, which needs to be excised. We still use uh, Boyd's, uh, depending on the amount of bone we need, either Boyd's tibial cortical grafts or cortical cancellers from the hip. Uh, if the distal segment is short, I cross uh, transcalcaneal and I still use a wrap periosteal graft. Uh, I gave you the reasons why I do the stages of trying to create the fibula and the tibia separately, purely because of operative time, bleeding and safety. Uh, and we create the synostosis at the second round. And more and more recently, we are adding an additional plate. I'll show you some examples. Uh, so generally, we still follow ben, uh, ben Joseph's protocol. So this is uh, anterolateral bow with an early stress fracture. So you can see that uh, we have used uh, what is called a TST rod, 
which is half the price of the FD rot. Uh, that's why we moved on to that. And we use uh, sort of, of course, in the middle, the incision is big, the rest of it, the plate is railroaded under the skin. And then we span, I use it like a spanning plate. So this went on to heal very well. And this is another one, type four, as you can see. Uh, and this boy was very small, so we had to wait a long time before he reached at least 10 kilograms. And then he went on to have uh, the same technique. We had revised him once because his, his rod, we had to exchange and we had to push it through. And he's got his tibia to heal. Now he's, uh, his sorry, tibia is healed. We're waiting for the fibular osteosynthesis. Uh, quite often, I may use just an intermediary wire or we can use a smaller plate of the same uh, company, uh, which is quite nice and thin. This is an uh, unfortunate complication. I thought I should share it with you. Uh, uh, type 4 Crawford, I did the classic technique uh, with the transcalcaneal upwards. If you see, all my bone grafts have disappeared uh, gradually. Then we went on to use a frame and try to do bone transport. And even after that, uh, the infection became quite extensive and we had to bail out. I had to remove uh, the uh, microbiology team said that you have uh, it grew a combined organism and she also developed MRSA. So we had to completely bail out, remove everything apart from the wire, which I had to leave just in case, just to keep stability. And now uh, all the parameters of infection are normal. And now I'm going to go back and do a stage to masculate through the introsious membrane, just like the one I did in the past. Unfortunately, I couldn't get those pictures for you because it's an older patient. I couldn't get them from my uh, from a from a PAC system. More recently, as you know, this nice paper has been published by Mark T. Dahl, who came in JBJS. I always thought about using guided growth, but I wondered whether it'll correct a diaphyseal deformity to that great extent. But uh, it'll be good for you all, whoever is keen, if when you see anterolateral bow of tibia, probably you could think of uh, giving a lesser uh, choice of using a eight plate or guided growth in the oblique plane. As you can see, there's pictures in the oblique plane. This is the first one we have done uh, after the parents agreed to it, after I showed them the paper. I think this is something we will be pursuing more and more for the anterolateral bow of tibia. So to conclude, it's still a challenging disorder. And though evolving treatment has improved results, uh, though Paley says he's got 100% results, I'm not too sure why the rest of us are not getting the same. Uh, there are many questions regarding the management of pseudarthrosis, but they are all getting answered. I think the time has come to have an international uh, registry. Uh, Tony Cooper from Vancouver is uh, pushing ahead with that. I'll be part of it. And Hitesh Shah is also. And I think... Uh, if you all want to be a part of this registry, do get in touch with, with myself or even Hitesh or uh, Tony Cooper in Vancouver. And like I mentioned, I think for the anterolateral bow, guided growth may be a good option. Uh, at least seven to eight out of 10 will have reasonable results. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Excellent presentation, actually. So, are there any questions within the panel? Dr. Mandar? Um, I haven't received any. Madam, you have. Yes, uh, thanks a lot for the great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, when do you use external fixer? Nowadays, you have stopped using uh, Elizaro for CPT. Uh, it is a reserve now. So primary cases, when they come to me, uh, I'm using now intermediary rod, uh, plating, BMP, periosteal wrap. And I think I'm getting better and better results, uh, I suppose. And we just then have to, only thing is you have to remember those plates have to be removed. I remove them at 12 months and then I exchange the rod to slightly thicker rod. If I go transcalcaneal, uh, what I've been doing is then I will exchange that when I've got full union and the tibia is straight. I will then drop the rod through the knee and put a blocker if I need uh, in the distal tibial epiphysis so that the rod, the female bow, the male part of the rod doesn't drop off. Okay. Yeah. But the external fixator I have kept as for rescue operations or if they come as classic hypertrophic type where possibly you can distract in them. They're not that common at the moment. So I've done a few where I've got successful results in my initial series. 
Uh, but yes, you're right. Uh, there is a little drive in uh, how things are moving on uh, in our unit or in the UK, maybe uh, there's a slight drive to move away wherever we can with external fixation to, to some extent. I'm sure uh, patients in India also may not prefer the external fixator if you give them internal fixation choices, I suppose. Yeah. That's true. Um, I have a question, if I may. It was yeah. a great talk. Uh, you mentioned about using Maskele technique. Could you yeah. tell us a little bit more? So it's that? a modif It's not a classic Maskele. So, so basically, let's say the tibia got infected, and then quite a bit of the area will have to be resected. And then if you have to try to get more bone, most of the time we might have taken bone grafts from the hip already. So what I have done is we do a first stage uh, through, depending on what incisions we've used before, we sort of, I lay a complete uh, thin sort of uh, uh, antibiotic loaded cement uh, inside that above the introscious membrane, right across from the top to the bottom, uh, preparing the fibula already. And so that when I come back in six weeks, that part will have enough of new membrane and that's the time I use bone graft from the posterior part of the pelvis because you get good cancellous bone. Use BMP and then lay the whole thing. So basically it produces a sheet of bone connecting the proximal tibia to the fibula and the distal tibia to the fibula. So that's what I've been, uh, you know, so the, uh, one was very successful. I'm going to, I think we did two. This is another third one, which is coming up. And then I'm doing one for an unusual infection in osteogenesis uh, of the tibia where the tibia is disappearing. Uh, so, so that's like an unusual type of masculine, I call it. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, uh, Jim, sir, uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Actually, I'm having one question that uh, in the younger children, just uh, two and a half to three years, and uh, if they come with a fracture, with a severe deformity, so uh, is there any tips and tricks for acute correction? You don't get uh, neurovascular issues. In neurovascular issues, you mean? Uh, in the, in, in a, uh, while doing acute correction for the nailing and... No, generally not. But yes, you know, quite often, I'm not saying I, uh, I previously I used to resect more bone, whichever was dense. Now I don't take that amount of bone. What I do is even if it's dense, I recreate the canal and then prepare with multiple uh, drill holes on the cortical surfaces by cooling it. And then I think because we also add a rod inside as, and then put BMP and cancellous bone, uh, the healing is much better. So my amount of resection of bone has become less and less. So even if you resect, you can shorten a little bit, then there's no big problem with the neurovascular structure. So I don't actually bother that amount uh, to keep the length. You can shorten a bit and then you can avoid even uh, contralateral Boyd's uh, grafts as well, the tibial grafts. That's what Benjamin Joseph published in his uh, onlay type of technique, which also I've done a few times and they're, they're quite good as well. But mm -hmm. I use them only when I need uh, uh, to fill a gap. Yeah. Thanks, I have a question. Okay. I have yes. a question. Uh, Ravi? Yeah, Dr. Sadish, please go ahead. Uh, Jim, sir, very nice presentation. You covered almost all the aspects from beginning to end and the recent uh, uh, methods also. I would like to ask you a question regarding uh, what is your protocol for lengthening? When do you lengthen? And what is the uh, age or uh, do you, uh, when do you recommend lengthening? Lengthening in general or uh, specifically for this cohort? For CPTs. For CPTs. Oh yeah. So basically uh, the main initial treatment is mainly for union. So that's the, that's the critical thing. So once we have got union, then we only uh, look at how, what the final height of the child is, whether we can use uh, contralateral epiphysiodesis as part of the technique to, to equalize them. And the odd one possibly where the length difference is going to be significant. Then yes, we will use an external fixator to, to lengthen depending on what the final LLD is predicted. So, so I don't have a clear cut, what to say, an age for that, unlike say, let's say conjunctal short femur or PFFD, but these are based on 
what what the final prediction is or what complications we have seen only then will i consider lengthening at the right time is there any cut off point or anything like that uh, like 5 cm 6 cm anything yeah like so that? i use a combination of both uh, final height and 5 cm or more so those two things so anyone if the parents and child feel that uh, they are eventually going to be short now nf children won't be tall so you have to really talk to them and ask now nf also are prone to more complications uh, with their treatment when you go a second time or a third time so we do counsel them a lot and they also well versed uh, they check on literature and everything nowadays and uh, then decide but yes we have lengthened uh, more than 5 cm less than 5 probably all err on the side of contralateral epiphysitis unless they're going to be really short and uh, 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 if you plan for lengthening uh, what is the rate and rhythm you you so i think first is the site so if you are going to go to the proximal metaphysis where most of these pseudoarthrosis are not affected then i think the rate and this one can be dictated by whatever with your depending on age and depending on what type of technique you use because we are, we all use the ilsa corticotomy i may do anywhere between 5 to 7 days so that will be the thing but there are there are some pseudoarthrosis of tibia where when you see lesions right going to the proximal tibia they are the ones you have to be careful so the ones where we did uh, resection and vascular fibula graft they were the ones the one which failed was exactly at the top end also it did not heal because there were lesions uh, uh, right at the top as well so i think you have to look at and i think that kind of condition may not be the nf type it's got something more than nf like a fibrous dysplasia kind of pathology extending top to bottom yeah yes. thanks a lot sir uh, do you aim sure. for cross union between uh, tibia and fibula at the fracture site not not That's at the first true. time purely because uh, you need a lot of graft Uh, i don't know whether you came to brisbane draw uh, and mark dal had a big argument because he was talking about uh, taking a uh, uh, cancellous bone from both the iliac uh, bones yeah, yeah. and i think one child of his had four units of blood loss which oh, possibly is four times the child's volume My and uh, so uh, we are not that i know we we try to be very safe and i also look at the weight of the child at least they have to reach more than 10 kg or minimum even uh, for for sort of to make sure that i'm not very aggressive i don't mind coming back and do a second go uh, for the fibula and that's the time i will deal uh, second round the fibula osteosynthesis and then try to create the synostosis at that point now interestingly there are one or two without uh, uh, attempting synostosis there was one example went on to synostosis so so i'm sure uh, i'm sure bmp also leaks goes around and then <laughs> does some wonderful things yeah okay. uh, sir james sir there is one question from the audience how do you fix when there is a small distal tibia yeah so that if that, that's the reason why then you have to change your plan for the rod to be transcalcaneal so it has to be a retrograde rod uh, which should have uh, uh, some kind of threads to 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 purchase in the calcaneum you can still put a plate because uh, uh, there will be at least uh, you can put two screws at the bottom you're putting a spanning plate on top of it so you can still do that but yes uh, those distal ones definitely you need a transcalcaneal uh, intermedullary rod thanks james i have a question <laughs> Yes, proceed, uh, Doctor Mandar. You can. So the question is that while resecting, always do you get transverse cuts, or when there is a scler sclerosis tip, you try to put one into another? Good, good. That's a good question. So that is like pushing a spigot into a canal. So uh, the one, I think, the last second example I showed. That's what we did. We pushed uh, that little tip of the atrophic one. into the distal segment which we have made it like a little spigot split it a little bit open like you you cut it like a mercedes benz and then you sink them together and then you put all your bone graft around so yes uh, that, that's a good technique as well so i think that used to be i think it is called the vinet or method in tibial fractures do you remember vinet or uh, old books will give it 
So Vinet or I think described it for tibial fractures and non union where uh, the, the the atrophic site was jammed into the canal of the distal site. Yeah. Thank you. So Thank you. Uh, uh, I so think in we your experience, closely. yeah. Sorry, sir. In your experience, have you seen the uh, patients with uh, limb length discrepancy? They will catch the growth at the end of the maturity. I don't think so. Uh, there are other conditions where we have said done one lengthening, and then we think there has to be another one. So there has been. There's a bit of evidence somewhere. They say, uh, I think, I don't know whether it was an achondroplasia. If you lengthen uh, in girls below the age of nine and above the age of nine, there is some uh, growth inhibition. Whereas growth acceleration is also possible. So yeah, you are right. But I don't think in pseudarthrosis because you do <coughs> quite a bit of length, it does not catch up to the same extent. Sir, uh, one question. If you compare both the modalities, intramedullar fixation and external fixation, mm. how you decide how much to excise and what is the end point in both the modalities? Both the modalities is the same. I will still now, now I think that the bone is normal, according to me. So I just, yeah. So I want that bone to prepare to accept the nail or rod which I'm putting inside. That's all I do. And then, whichever, however you, way you want, if you want to impact, like the previous example I gave, you can impact the narrow one into the distal tibia where you can open up the tibia by three cuts. It splits open. You can do that. Or, but, but I don't resect bone anymore uh, unless required only for preparation to get a rod inside. They say that you should excise till the punctate bleeding. That is the previous thought. Is it the no. same concept or the concept are changing? I don't think, I don't wait for, because they're all under tunicate, to see punctate bleeding is not that easy. But I'm not very, because when we remove bone graft from elsewhere, they are also dead. This is also a dead graft. So I don't think it makes much of a difference mm. uh, from that point of view. Uh, I do not actually, I used to resect a lot in previous years in my initial career, but I've moved away and I think uh, all for the better, according to me. Okay, thank you. Uh, Someone has asked, how do you fix when they, uh, that is answered? Yeah. Thank yeah, you. so that is answers. Can I ask one more? Yeah, ma'am, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about ankle valgus? How do you treat it? Okay. That's yes. a good, the very good question you said, because uh, I was thinking about it because all our older <coughs> kids were all like developing calcaneo valgus feet because we ignored the fibula. Yes. Uh, and I started to gradually osteosynthesize the fibula and somewhere in one of the meetings, someone said, why, are you, why do you do that? And very interestingly, at another Asami meeting, uh, uh, it is, was it Choi or one of the Korean papers they published as well, where they, they looked at ankle scores after doing fibular osteosynthesis, they were far superior. And I'm now more and more particular about getting that fibula to unite even where I have solitary pseudarthrosis, the fibula, with mm -hmm. a very mild bow of the tibia, I will osteosynthesize the fibula. Okay. Uh, purely, you will see migration of that fibula a bit more posterior and proximal, and that is good enough for the ankle to go into valgus, and their ankle scores are poor. Yeah. Uh, sir, there is one question from Dr. Jindinwala. Jindinwala, sir, please unmute yourself. Can yeah, you please hear? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. How oh. should arthrosis heal up when patient falls down and get a fracture of the tibia? What That's treatment correct. you give? Yeah, same thing. We uh, every child, if I have to use growing rods, at the right age, I actually exchange the rods to bigger rods. So as long as there's an internal rod, we are not worried. But we don't want any patient without a rod inside at the moment. And usually. At adulthood, what I do now nowadays is I actually exchange the final rod to an adult humeral rod. I put a humeral rod, which is seven millimeters, and then drop it down. The humeral rod has got the same angle as the tibial rod. So I just use that, and that's, that's usually what the final treatment is, yeah. I had uh, two cases like that, and uh, 
uh, in my cases, I don't use rod. Yeah. It is the Elizaru treatment we give. Correct. And in those cases, I put uh, plaster immobilization for six to eight weeks and fracture sealed up. Yeah, but we have had here where people have done that elsewhere, but then we have got non-union as well. So I think it's all a bit of a matter of, you know, depending on what the original primary treatment was. So if you have excised the hamatoma, probably they might go to go on to heal. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. So, Dr. Manda, now we can move to yes. the next uh, presentation. Yes. So the next presentation will be by Dr. Satish Nesri, sir. I request him to... Uh, share. I will share it now. Good evening, everybody. I thank uh, our president, uh, Dr. Ruta Kulkarni, madam, for uh, giving me opportunity to present um, my experience in our civil hospital, uh, Belgium. So I'm from uh, Belgium. So I pay my tribute uh, to the great uh, Elizaro uh, surgeon uh, who, has, who is a great scientist, philosopher, academic, academician. On uh, June 15th, we'll be celebrating his 100th birthday. So with this, I would like to start my case presentation. This is a 10 year old boy um, uh, residing in a tribal area, uh, came to civil hospital, Belgium. Um, he was brought by a social worker, local social worker. Uh, according to the parents history, the deformity gradually progressed uh, uh, when the child started walking at the age of uh, two years, it gradually worsened. Um, so initially, the parents used to take him to the uh, uh, to, uh, to the school. Um, then gradually, uh, he started walking with the help of uh, support like crutches or a chair. So this is the X-ray. Sorry for the poor AP view. This is a pure uh, uh, Crawford Type Four. Uh, CPT with uh, pseudarthrosis of tibia as well as fibula at the middle third, lower third junction. So I proceeded with uh, excision of the hematoma and uh, excision of the bone uh, with IM rod inside. And uh, I harvested uh, iliac periosteal graft and a cancellous bone from the iliac bone and also did the excision of fibula pseudarthrosis. So this, this picture shows the excision of the hematomous tissue as well as the tapered end bones. So here uh, the periosteum has been harvested. So normally uh, I elevate the iliacus muscle and then uh, incise the periosteum or the inner table of the iliac crest and then um, uh, excise a, 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 a rectangular or a square type of uh, square shape of periosteum and then harvest the bone graft with the minimal damaging the iliac epiphysis. So this is how the, the uh, periosteal, uh, uh, periosteum is wrapped around the ends, bone ends and then graft is inserted. So this is the immediate post-op picture. I used a three ring, uh, three ring frame, a hybrid frame with uh, uh, all wires in the proximal as well as distal ring with uh, one uh, shan spin and one wire in the middle ring. So this is the immediate post-op picture. This is how it looked. It's a intramedullary wire from the inserted from the calcaneum and uh, the patient lost for follow-up and uh, landed to me with uh, after two and a half months of the initial surgery. Uh, by this time, the, the, the pseudarthrotic site already started healing. And uh, 
so after two and a half months of the initial initial surgery i did a corticotomy with destruction of uh, 5 mm uh, 0.5 mm per day so this is one and a half months after doing a corticotomy um, uh, at the time of corticotomy i I inserted a additional shan spin in the proximal uh, ring in order to have a good stable uh, base. So I continued the distraction 0.5 millimeter per day. And at the end of three months, I could attend, I, I could get a six centimeters lengthening um, and uh, with a good uh, regenerate. And uh, um, after uh, four months after stopping the distraction, this was the picture with a, a good uh, regenerate formation and a complete union of the pseudoarthrotic site. Uh, and after six months of the of stopping or uh, uh, one year uh, after initial surgery, this was the picture. The, the, the patient had absolutely no complications, no problem. And uh, this is the picture before removal of the fixator. So after uh, removal of the fixator, I applied Aboni cast for two months and uh, later converted into Biloni cast. Um, so this is the picture after uh, removal of the fixator and uh, when the patient was in Biloni cast. So this is the uh, video of the patient walking. This is during the distraction phase. And uh, this is during the consolidation phase, patient walking comfortably. This is uh, the patient walking with the baloney cast. And this is the recent picture that is two years uh, after the initial surgery. Patient is going to school and he is independently walking. So these are the uh, clinical pictures. Uh, he's going to the school and uh, the limb length discrepancy also has been mentioned, uh, has been uh, maintained. So external fixation time was uh, 12 months. Um, so it took six, six centimeters for six centimeters lengthening, it took three months and additional six months for consolidation phase. So uh, the acid arthrosis healed within three months and the patient was comfortable uh, throughout the procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nishri, for such a nice case presentation. Any question from within the panel? That's a nice result, to be very frank. Yeah. I just wonder whether having a rod in that may benefit you in the future. Uh, yeah, I, I need to remove the rod and insert it from the yeah. uh, proximal uh, side, sir. Well, that's a good result. Yeah, but I think because the refracture rate, uh, if you look at all the series, when you don't yes. have something inside, probably yeah. maybe the having an internal uh, splint comes yes. in handy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Junjunwala, sir, you are having a question. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, I do mostly the same type of treatment, but I don't put grafts. I don't take iliac graft or I don't put any graft because the osteotomy also, I do the same time, same surgery, same sitting. And when you start lengthening at this osteotomy site, there is increased circulation, which helps to unite at the pseudoarthrosis level. And therefore, there is no need of graft, I feel so. In all my 14 cases, I never put graft, and still all, all 14 cases healed up well. Thank you. Yeah, please, Dr. Gunnar. Uh, I just want to ask James, sir, about this case, uh, whether any need to uh, fix the ankle in this case to prevent the latter valgus deformity? Uh, at this moment in time, I think, I, I mean, I can't remember the last x-ray. It may be worthwhile. I suppose to get a better result, it's worthwhile. If it's borderline, maybe it's okay. 
But I think uh, if it is definitely, because as time goes by, if that fibula migrates, then you will start to get into trouble. In the last x-ray, the fibula healed, sir. It has healed. Okay. okay. Yeah. Huh. And also the intramedullary rod, it helps uh, in uh, uh, getting a good stability and early union at the uh, pseudo-arthrotic site. Is it a good idea to do tibiofibular fusion prophylactically to prevent further ankle valgus? Mm -hmm. We do not know as yet how many in the future after creating a synostosis will still so, develop valgus, I think. Probably with the uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, transarticular uh, pin, uh, it will go for uh, ankylosis. Okay, so you will produce ankylosis purposely. Yes. Of the one. Okay. But you could you could change it. So I do remove and then exchange it from the top. So you could yeah. change it and put a, a kind of different system or TST rod, even a, even a single rod if you want. Uh, a female, write down and then leave it there and then. So in, the, in that case, with uh, FD nail with uh, that. Locking hole will be available. That will that would be better. See the thing about the FD nail to put that little wire. It takes you more than an hour unless you are you are so lucky. So I don't try to. Of course, we don't use the FD rod anymore because uh, they charge phenomenal amount of money. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So I don't see a big difference because I do a lot of osteogenesis. We use a lot of uh, growing rods, and they all have the similar problem. Even if you put a wire or anything. Because there is no purchase at the top end anyway. You can get the rod uh, pulled through or pushed through at both ends. So I, I don't think there's any great superiority by putting a wire. I know that Draw Paley uh, has made uh, the company Pega make some special rods just for him. Uh, and, and, and if you see those ends of his mail are totally different uh, in his pictures, if you see. Uh, so they are different. So the standard PEGA uh, FD rods are mainly made for osteogenesis and very few of us actually put a wire across. It takes a lot. It's less than a millimeter in diameter. I don't know what Dr. Kulkani has to say about putting a wire through that. It's like a needle in a haystack. <laughs> I agree. It's extremely difficult to negotiate that. Yeah. It will take a lot of time and radiations. Yeah, yeah. Your know, anesthetists will be after you, at least in the UK. <laughs> if there are no questions, then we can move by Dr. Mandar for yeah. the next presentation. Yeah, I request Dr. Gurunath Vachche to present this case. Good evening. Uh, myself, Dr. Gurunath Vache, Associate Professor of Orthopedics, Dr. VM Government Medical College, Solapur. I just want to share one interesting case of congenital pseudoarthrosis tibia, which was treated in 2001 with uh, the Elizarao external fixator, ring fixator, with the proximal corticotomy. So, uh, the seven year boy presented to me with the severe congenital uh, uh, pseudoarthrosis tibia. As we all know, this is the most challenging and controversial topic in pediatric orthopedics. So the patient presented with severe uh, anterolateral bowing deformity at the junction of middle and distal third of the tibia. And he was walking with a difficulty, but he was uh, uh, with short limb gait. There was any no any significant obstetric history. His milestones were developed at appropriate for his age, except walking. The associate problems were he, he was having short limb gait and severe anterolateral bowing deformity of the leg. His ankle was in the bulgus and uh, interestingly, the foot was very small size. My aim was to achieve and maintain union simultaneously providing the functional extremity. So you can see the preoperative clinical photograph so much of the severe deformity with such a deformity also the patient was walking with uh, somewhat short limb uh, gait. This is the preoperative x-ray which confirms the severity of the uh, condition 
and you can appreciate that there is almost 90 degree uh, anterolateral bowing deformity with pseudoarthrosis of the tibia and the fibula. So my planning was uh, longitudinal incision, lazy S-shaped incision, excision of the CPT segment as far as possible, uh, then acute docking considering the neurovascular status with temporary intramedullary long K-wire to prevent the translation or any deformity on the site and then application of the pre-assembled Elizaro fixator and with the proximal corticotomy with the same sitting. The intraoperative findings were the CPT site was very stiff at the fibula and the tibia. There was a very little uh, mobility and there was complete blockage of the medullary canal and the neurovascular status was normal even after acute docking. The total surgical time was five and a half hours. The tourniquet was released in between. It was done in the spinal anesthesia. This is the immediate post-op x-ray. You can see the uh, excised uh, CPT site with uh, uh, Elizaro fixator in C2. This is the proximal corticotomy site. And here I have used the olive wire to maintain the translation. These are the follow-up x-rays you can see. The CPT site is in uh, reduction position and the uh, regeneration is progressive. You can appreciate the regeneration in AP and lateral. These are the clinical photographs under treatment. This is the photographs with distraction in C2. You can appreciate the formation of the cortex in AP and lateral position. But here I found that there was little bit procurvatum deformity at the proximal fragment because the proximal site uh, fragment was very small and probably with uh, so much of distraction that was going in the procurvatum deformity, but I uh, uh, felt that it should be kept like that. These are the follow-up distraction x-rays in progress. You can see the uh, slight union at the CPT site has already started. And now you appreciate the good regeneration and uniting CPT site. These are the almost final x-rays before the fixator removal. The almost four cortices are well developed and the CPT site is also in uniting position. So this is the final x-ray after the union at the CPT site. And these are the x-rays just before the fixator removal see the uh, regeneration quality and the United CPT site. So the my post-op protocol was distraction started after four to seven days, daily one mm distraction. Total regeneration was almost uh, six to seven centimeter. The fixator time was one year and four months. And post fixator removal, I have uh, given the protective caliper for almost two years. So physiotherapy, post-op physiotherapy and pin tract care is also very important. You can see patient doing physiotherapy with fixator, Elizaro fixator with the foot frame. The knee movements are almost uh, full and the ankle in normal position. So this is the x-ray after the post fixator removal x-ray, united uh, the CPT site, good regeneration. And with there is slight procurbatum deformity at the uh, proximal corticotomy site. These are the one and a half years follow post-op x-rays good formation of the cortex in AP and lateral position. These are the two years follow-up x-rays. You can appreciate the uh, regeneration. There is no fracture till two years. So these are the clinical photographs. You, these are the post fixator clinical photographs. You can appreciate the foot size is very small. These are the photographs with caliper for two years to prevent the refractures. And uh, this is the follow-up X-ray even after 20 years. So you can appreciate that this is the at the age of seven years pre-op. This is at the nine years after the caliper removal. And this is at the age of 27 years of the age. So this is the follow-up X-ray after 27 years. You can see the procurbatum deformity is almost corrected. There is slight varus angulation at the CPT site. Foot size is still small as compared to the normal size and the heel is also hypoplastic. 
So this is the clinical photograph, lucky surgeon and happy patient after 20 years. So these are the clinical photographs. So thanks uh, to Dr. Shekhar Chudgupkar, who has given me opportunity to treat this case at Chudgupkar Hospital in 2001. And this is the OT team. Thanks to the OT team. Thank you very much. It was really a nice case with excellent results and such a long and good follow-up. Really nice. So can I make a comment, please? Yeah, ma'am, please. Yeah. Uh, so, what's a uh, very good case uh, result and follow-up. Thank you. Uh, but I think it was not a dysplastic type of pseudoarthrosis. It was a stiff type of pseudoarthrosis. And yes. uh, such uh, pseudoarthrosis can be treated just by distraction. If you just distract and correct the deformity, you can have union. That's my experience. So if the bone ends are not dysplastic, you may not even have to reset the pseudoarthrosis, especially if it's a virgin case, if it's yeah. not operated before. So you can just distract and uh, these unite. So James, sir, do you think, have any comment? I think I would agree with you. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think they behave. Uh, I think when they have the stiff non-union, they are not like I don't think they have the classic hamartomatus, too much of a lesion. So I think under distraction there is change and uh, you know bone, new bone forms. So we have done a couple. Uh, you know when we used to do more fixators, and we don't get such severe cases late in this country. So but probably you will be seeing it more in India and Africa. So, yeah, I would fully agree that you could have attempted uh, without resecting, but yes, you have got a good result, no doubt, uh, which just possibly would, uh, would increase your frame time, if at all, I suppose. But it's a good long to 20 years. Yes. You know, you're like you say, so, you know, not all the time we are lucky. I think I'm not saying you are lucky. You have done your technique quite well. The only other thing, that's a little tip for to prevent proximal procovatum deformity. So tibial lengthening, when you start doing anything more than four centimeters, usually will get uh, uh, valgus uh, procovatum deformity. So one of the things uh, in Kurgan many, many years ago, they, what they do is they, they call it the antromedial open ring. So your first ring, I'm sure many of you know that, so if you ring, put your set your ring, not parallel, but it is more open medial and you set your uh, four rods or three rods, you set them in an oblique plane of an anteromedial hinge at that ring. So at the end of your treatment, it's called preempting the deformity. So you know the deformity is going to come because you're going to go for six centimeters of length. So at the end of your lengthening, you do asymmetric distraction. It actually doesn't oblique plane correction at the same time. So just a little practical tip if you want to use for future cases. Uh, though the child has done well into adulthood, yeah. Yes, yes sir. thank you. Thank you. So I request Ruta Madam to present her case. Okay, I'll share my screen. Okay, so my case, sorry for that. Okay, it's visible. Yeah, ma'am, please go ahead. Okay, so my case is this six-year-old girl came to me with this deformity and shortening. She was operated three times before she came to me. You can see all the scars here. And even uh, Elizaro was done by someone else before she came to me. So this was her x-ray. You can see the bony ends are tapering, dysplastic. And there is osteopenia also, this deformity and shortening. So I did reset the pseudoarthrosis. I resected the hematomatous periosteum, which is the most important step, both in tibia and fibula. And then I put a rush rod, retrograde rush rod, because the distal fragment was very small. So from calcaneus to talus ankle into the tibia. 
and then I put four ring frame, the foot ring, the distal uh, fragment has one ring and the proximal fragment has two rings. I did corticocancellous bone grafting at the fracture site, did corticotomy above in the same sitting and started distraction there. So you can see the regenerate is now consolidated very well. And even the pseudoarthrosis is showing union. So almost after nine or 10 months, I got good union. And then I casted her for three months and put her in brace uh, after three months. And she walked on the brace and the rod broke because it was a thin rod. So I removed the distal part of the rod. This is her four year follow up. The remnant of the rod is now a souvenir, lifelong souvenir for her. But she was doing quite fine. You can see there is no limb length discrepancy and there was no deformity. And this is her 10 year follow up x ray. So uh, she has just one centimeter of limb length discrepancy, but full function and absolutely no refracture. She didn't use brace for a long time after that. But the rod was acting as a splint inside, probably. So she did quite well. Uh, this is a similar case. This boy was also operated twice before he came to me. And there is, you can see the scars. So I did the same thing. I uh, followed exactly all the steps. But you can see this time I put a thicker rod here. And you can see corticotomy and regeneration and even the CPT is uniting. I put a rod in fibula this time. And this is after removal of uh, fixator. He is in cast for three months and then brace. He was walking in the brace, but after one year, I removed the retrograde rod and put an anti-grade rod. This is again a square nail. And this is his nine year follow up x ray. So uh, he was actually lost to follow up and he came very late, uh, only after nine years. He is doing quite well, uh, but the ankle has gone in valgus. There is proximal, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the distal tibia has procurvatum and valgus deformity. So I offered him a supramalleolar dome osteotomy to correct his deformity, but he blatantly refused any surgery. He was ha quite happy with the result. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I think that's that's nice result. I think having an intramedullary rod does help, and I think uh, I think the fibula is very important. I think uh, we we, yeah. have, we have been ignoring for a long time. I think overall you got a very good result there for both your cases. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but I think we I think another problem we have in uh, in the Western world is because many of them want to go back to sport. Oh. See, see, so when they want to do sport and everything, the chance of refracture rate is high. So having something inside does help us uh, because even if they do something and they fracture, at least it just breaks and you know you can treat it even non-operatively for some time. Uh, I don't know how much of our patients, children in India, eventually do, you know, if they have to break or fall, they have to fall from you know, if they're not doing sport, that has to be something significant, isn't it? Uh, but we, yes, that cal India, sorry, cal we would advocate uh, them not to go in sports. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> won't take that risk. We can't say that here. <laughs> <laughs> they will, we will ask first: Is can I go and kick the football? As a, especially for yeah, even girls. Yeah. yeah. I have a question, uh, sir. Yeah, uh, uh, James, sir. Um, uh, uh, in a Ruthamadam case, if suppose a patient agreed for an osteotomy, corrective osteotomy, how do we deal? Should we uh, plan the same way as we plan for CPT, like bone grafting, osteotomy, bone grafting, and then? I would think so because uh, the previous, the suda, original pseudoarthrosis was very low. Though we excise the obvious hamartoma, I wonder whether some of the pathology is still there behind, even more distal than what we think. Uh, only problem with all these, which we also had in our original series, is 
uh, they do have like a calcaneo valgus uh, compensation with uh, with the distal tibial uh, valgus uh, procavatum at the distal tibia as well. So you may have to be careful how you think when you do your dome because your foot will now from a compensated position may go to a decompensated position. Uh, so it's a little, uh, uh, I would say, a middle path somewhere to make sure that the foot is still plantigrade and has got still some movement in the subtalar joint to compensate. If the subtalar joint is also lost some movement or become stiff, then you, it becomes a bit more difficult. So you may have to compromise on the way you set it. But yes, it's still a risk uh, in that area where, where possibly, you know, chance of healing is still not the greatest. And if they're associated with the NF, I think I would, uh, you know, I would be even more uh, cautious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this particular boy didn't have NF basically, yeah. and he was skeletally mature. He was almost seven, 16, 17 years old. Yeah. And I was planning to do a supramedular osteotomy very near to the ankle, very low supramedular yeah. osteotomy, including fibula, and turn that ankle. His subtalar joint was supple. Okay. So, but anyway, uh, probably I was saved because he refused. <laughs> he refused. Mm -hmm. it. So, yeah, sometimes I also say, listen to the patient as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is one question from Dr. Vigneshwaran that uh, about the tibio fibular cross union. Basically, he's asking just uh, to reduce the fracture re refracture rate. So, James, sir, what's your take on how often you go for uh, tibio fibular cross unions? And Dr. Satish also, uh, have you uh, do you keep in mind about the tibio fibular cross union? During your management, because in your case presentation, your case was not having that. So, do you keep in mind? Yeah, that? I asked asked him this question before to James. Yeah, yeah. So, cross union. The only reason I don't go in the first go is uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, you need a lot of graft, uh, and if you want real good graft, you have to take it from both sides of the pelvis. Uh, yes, the bleeding sir. is a lot. Uh, the time of surgery extends quite a bit. Uh, for us, at least, the anesthetists become very twitchy uh, when there is quite a bit of blood loss in a small child. So that is why I do not do... So I go in stages. I would rather go in stages, be safe, than go in one gungo moment of doing everything in one, you know. Uh, it's all possible, but in the United Kingdom, if things go wrong, uh, if you get sued, you'll be called negligent very easily. It's not the same in the United States to some extent. So if you are a top surgeon, it's unlikely you'll get, uh, even if it gets sued, you know, there are very few people who will counter you. So yeah, so we do it purely because of safety rather than anything else. Yeah. And refracture uh, in CPT after union is uh, probably because of uh, residual deformity. If there is any residual deformity, it will cause a stress uh, or the CPT site as well as the proximal to the CPT site and that's how they land with the refractures. So uh, we have to correct the deformity properly. So the benefit nowadays because we are using more and more guided growth, uh, the subtleties of say proximal tibial valgus or distal tibial valgus, we can manage with guided growth. Uh, they do correct reasonably well. So I've used screws at the ankle, I've used sometimes O plates or eight plates. Uh, I see now with uh, using that plate on the medial side, I am getting overgrowth on the proximal medial tibia. So I have to add another uh, eight plate at the top as well. So, but these are simple procedures and you can keep maintaining alignment and have something inside. You're absolutely right. Anything bent is prone to break. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And uh, sir, uh, uh, for TB fibular stenostosis, uh, you said ki you stage, uh, you prefer to stage the procedure just to yeah. avoid the ble bleeding and all that. So, is there any time interval after the union of tibia uh, CPT that uh, you prefer to go for second second stage? Is there a time interval between that or such? The time interval is not kind of definite time, but union and re -can uh, canalization of the tibia is important. You need a canal, nice canal scene, and okay. then I will time it. We also have a little other timing things in the UK. We don't operate on important years of schooling. So I don't operate when they just join school or nursery. I'll do them after they go into year one 
uh, because they have to settle in the school. Uh, we organize a lot of things so that they get support in school as well. So lots of things, though textbook and people say, you know, you do it like even draw will say is PFFD, you'll do it two years, four years, seven years or no. We don't go according to that because uh, it's not someone's legs or it's all about the family and the society you live in. So sure. it's the same for you all. You know, when I come to India and do work, uh, when there's harvest season, nobody wants to come and have surgery, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. So it's, it's the same philosophy. So you need to, yeah. so I don't have hard and fast rules, but I will use fitting and the, to the benefit of everything. Uh, so yes, but yes, uh, main key thing, the tibia has to be absolutely nice and canal should be nicely formed and got it. Yeah. Then it's easy because then you're only tackling from the anterolateral side, from the fibular side, lifting it off to the tibia and then you can do a nice synostosis. Yeah. And we don't know how feasible the uh, the procedure of cross union in our setup. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose your limitation may be uh, BMP is too expensive. Uh, so I don't have to take so much of graft because uh, I use BMP. Uh, when I take the graft, just like you, I take the graft from the inner table only. I don't take the outer table. And I take the periosteal wrap from within, just like you showed. I think you showed that case. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's the same technique I use. However much the big the periosteum you remove, finally when it comes in your hand, it comes as a 50 pence per yes, yes. A patch. Actually, we have to make a mesh out of it. Yeah. So like we do That's skin crafting. That's what I do. We use a skin mesh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's correct. Yeah, you're right. But uh, that's why, um, you know, I try not to do, do a thing in stages. Yeah. And regarding the cross union, sir, uh, before uh, Dr. Pale, uh, Choi was the one who started cross union. Yeah, absolutely, you're right. And uh, the cross section of the uh, cross union site was uh, uh, less in Choi compared to Dr. Pale. So that's why the refracture. He, uh, Pale, uh, he claims that uh, the the zero refracture rate is because of a bigger cross section area of uh, cross union. I'm not too sure about that, but uh, we do not know there are lots of things. I mean, in, I mean, with no, with due respect to him, I mean, I we find it difficult when the uh, rest of everybody gets sort of complications and you know some of us oh you know it's, it's very difficult it's like sujaka's osteotomy yes. you know he had such great results but nobody else could repeat those results so are there any other questions dr mandar yeah if there are no questions we should proceed yeah I request. Uh, Rutama, we can proceed with the conclusion if uh, there are no further questions Okay, so it was a great discussion. Thank you very much, James, sir, for joining in and uh, giving us the overview of... Uh, Mandar is raising his yeah. hand. Yeah. Ashish, Ashish has to present the case. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Ravi asked me to conclude. Yeah, so. that, that was about your case yeah, presentation. And Ashish can then present. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Ashish, so I request Ashish, you present your case. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'll be quick. Um, Take your time, Ashish. I'm it sorry. will be, we are approaching. So it's a case that me and Mandar did together. Uh, two and uh, two years, seven month old girl with neurofibromatosis one. Uh, she had x-rays done somewhere else. And I thought that probably it's a cystic type, but uh, to my surprise, it fractured somewhere else. Uh, it, it fractured distally. So she came to me with this picture and considering her age, we did the uh, uh, only tibia grafting uh, using um, Dr. Benjamin Joseph's technique. We harvested graft from the medial side of the tibia and put a transcalcaneal rush rod. And that's how it was. It went on to heal well. We put her in a cast for three months and around three months time, we started weight bearing. At six months, we did a check x-ray to make sure the, the bone is healing on the opposite side. And it went on to heal well at 15 months. 
her leg lengths are almost equal slight difference she's managing well with the clamshell orthosis and then that's how she is at two and a half years so at this point we are planning for rod exchange will continue with the clamshell orthosis but uh, now listening to uh, mr fernandez's talk i'm wondering whether i should add a uh, uh, synostosis across this site thank you Can in, I ask uh, one? Sorry, Ruta. Yes, you carry on. No, no, please go ahead, sir. Please go. Ahead. Oh no, no, you mentioned. I was just going to make a comment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in this procedure, do you uh, come across graft resorption any time? Uh, usually not, ma'am. So far, I haven't come across graft resorption in tibia, fibula. Yes, I try to put few bits around the fibula, but there I have noticed resorption. and do you uh, recommend to add a plate like james has showed so uh, i am usually worried about having less space and the plate becoming too conspicuous underneath the skin so i keep that as plan b if i am going for another surgery then i add that but usually not as a primary measure and i i could see your patient was very young how old was she just two years seven months two years. Seven months okay yeah she was quite young so you usually operate at that age or usually yes with the uh, intramedullary rod i operate on yeah i think i think you can i i, I mean though we say from the epos and maybe even benjamin joseph says in his paper but i think anyone more than two and uh, provided they are reach the reasonable weight uh, i think they are reasonable to go ahead and have surgery i suppose i don't see a problem the plate uh, ashish is a very low profile plate mm -hmm. uh, and it actually uh, they can you can't even feel it quite often uh, with this to the subcutaneous plane and so the very low profile and the screws are locked into the plate so they don't stick out so okay. these are very near smith and nephew uh, plates which have come they're quite nice they've got all kinds of sizes from 2 mm 2.4 and 2.7 so you can even use the only good why i use a plate is i'm avoiding a frame avoiding a cast to a long cast that's all it is so it's actually uh, rotational stability in addition to everything else yeah okay uh, dr ashish yeah yes please uh, sir uh, from where do you harvest uh, the tibia graft so it's Which from the medial side of the tibia usually i go 3 4 cm below the proximal physis and typically around 6 or 8 cm long strip 6 or 8 cm long and about 2 cm wide is it is it from the anteromedial surface of the tibia more on the medial i try not to get the the shin. apex of the shin okay have you any time use fibula uh no i haven't used fibula did you use zolendronic acid preoperatively uh, no i am not using zolendronic acid okay. nice case sir thank you also when i have done the tibial contralateral graft you can also get valgus again on that side so just remember to keep an eye on the other leg uh, you yes. can calculate the amount of so basically you divide them into threes so that at the end you have got three strut grafts from that medial surface so you are actually taking only the medial wall that's all you're doing you are you are still your uh, the anterior shin the posterior medial shin are all intact it's a nice way to do it you can use a very fine 2 mm drill and then make tiny tiny holes in linear fashion and then again in the middle to split them into three or whatever how many you want to decide and then accordingly lift them up uh, and you'll get some cancellous bone as well with that yeah 
how do you fix at the pseudo arthritic side sir do you tie with a uh, vicryl or anything yeah, oh, it's, oh. it's it's like the bamboo hut procedure <laughs> just okay. okay yeah tie with suture that's what i do i don't know what ashish would have done but yeah no i i don't use anything i just, uh, just put some uh, yeah i just keep some um, um, gel foam over it and close the skin and uh, how uh, for how many days you will immobilize approximately 3 uh, months but after 2 months i start them uh, in a weight bearing cast uh, only after seeing the x ray after okay. seeing the x ray yes ashish when are you planning to change the rod from retrograde to so uh, i have little reservations about uh, any kind of growth nails because i have had problems where the nail has gone distally from the threaded portion and it's very uh, difficult to retrieve it so usually i'm trying to push that procedure till they are 7 or 8 years old when they can get at least a 6 mm nail and do you add, add uh, uh, cancellous bone graft also uh, no sir i i don't use cancellous bone graft any additional whatever bone comes with that um, cortical strip Okay. I use that. Any other questions? So I request Ruta Madam to give her concluding remarks. So uh, this was a great discussion. and i really thank from the bottom of my heart to dr james sir he spared his valuable time i also thank all the faculty for giving their very valuable inputs dr nesri dr wache dr ashish dr mandar so uh, thank you very much uh, ravi do you want to add any conclusion nothing nothing right now okay it was a nice evening yeah So Thank great you. job, uh, well done, Dr. Mandar and Dr. Ashish. Yeah, well done. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Thank, 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 Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night, Jim, sir. Thank you, and good night. Thank you, Jim, sir. Kindly share your number, contact number, please.